Okay, so this is one of my favorites because I like spectroscopy and I like fiddling around with fluorescence and so on. And so this is alternate light sources and how we detect evidence using alternate light sources. So there's we've talked about other analytical methods, you know, chemi wet chemistry methods, the extraction, isolation, and so on. Um, we've talked about colorimetric comparisons, you know, quantifying color, or even the Munsell catalog where you have letter designations like RP for red, purple, things like that. Um, and then we've done spectral analysis where we've quantified it for XYZ values and RGB values. And then you have some experience from PCHEM1 and using FTIR. And there's actually, in looking at paint, paints, we're kind of going down that road where quantifying color, we looked at the CIE tristimulus values. Um, this part of this lecture is also using the standards that they had for paint analysis. Uh, there is a paint database uh, uh, managed by the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted, Canadian Mounted Police. Um, I think that's kind of like, um, well, I guess that's federal. That might be like our FBI. Yeah, I was thinking more like our DPS, but I think it's more like the FBI in Canada. And then we have these uh, ASTM standards on ink and paint analysis. So I'm just using these as like, some example standards. And let's look inside sort of the, the analysis tree that they have in one of these standards. So this is a flow chart where if you have a, a paint sample, you can subject it to chemical tests where you go through and, um, and you, uh, you know, try to dissolve it, you know, take a part of the sample and try to dissolve it, try to extract various compounds from it and so on. Or you can use spectroscopy. You can um, use FTIR, um, thin layer chromatography, mass spec. Those are best for the organic components. Um, you have also, if you can scrape some off and get it into solution or maybe even use it in a spectrometer, like a, a, or a scanning electron microscope, you could get the heavy elements. So you could do an elemental analysis on it. And then you could do the microspectrophotometry, MSP. So that's what Dr. Lewis's talk is going to be on. And, and so she's going to be doing spectroscopy through the microscope. But today we're going to be talking about these things fluorescent spectroscopy and alternate light sources. So we're going to be hitting it with something other than visible light. The visible light is useful for getting the colors of the paint or pigments, um, but we're going to be hitting it with something that's going to make it fluoresce, and that's great for detection. So we'll look at, at uses of alternate light sources. Like near infrared is super useful, and then most of the time we talk about fluorescence, but sometimes just moving into the near infrared, which is just a little beyond 700 nanometers. It could be as close as like 900 nanometers. And there's a lot of detectors and camera elements that go a little bit below red. They go into the near infrared. The near part means it's near to the visible. In the FTIR, we're using the mid infrared. That's where you have isolated, uh, like single vibrations of all of the covalent bonds. So that's why it's like a fingerprint for the substance. It's in the mid infrared. Those are the 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 uh, fundamental vibrational absorptions. So from zero to one in the vibrational um, uh, energy or energy level diagram, you've got all of those fundamental vibrations, and it'll tell you what kinds of bonds you have, whether it's a CH stretch or a carbonyl and so on. When you get up to the near infrared, you're looking at overtones. So it's going from zero to two or zero to three, and the uh, Transition dipole moment integrals that we calculated in PCHEM, those are, uh, some of those are so small that we wouldn't see the signal. So it's hard to predict what you're going to see in the near infrared. So we're really not using the near infrared for spectroscopy to identify what the substance is. We're using it for imaging. So look at this example here. This is a, a note that some criminal or whatever, some person that was uh, afraid of, of this information getting out, they obliterated it with a Sharpie or some black marker. And then you look in the near infrared, you can see right through it. So that's, now how does that work? Well, it's because the thing he wrote with, the ballpoint pen, had a different pigment in it than the Sharpie. And as long as you can get a different absorption profile, like in the near infrared, you can see one and not the other. Okay, so he, so if you're going to obliterate your writing, you need to use exactly the same pen. Right, because it has to have exactly the same pigment, the same carrier, the same everything. So now I've taught you how to like hide your stuff. But it also, uh, there's an ancient Greek philosopher that says you never step in the same river twice. 
What is his point? You can never step in the same river twice. And this is the point of this is, is can you really use the same pen? So you make a mark. What's happening to that mark after you've made it? Oxygen is attacking that thing. And so things change constantly. So you can't step in the same river twice. You step in the river, you step out. You're going to step in the river, but the water's already moved on. Some of the soil's gone. Everything's changing all of the time. And so it's very difficult. Even if you use the same Sharpie, the time between when you wrote it and when you obliterated it, something's happened to the to the Sharpie that was on the paper. Not much, though, if there's a short time frame then not much has changed. And so you might still be able to obliterate that writing. But if there's a long time change, then oxygen and moisture and all kinds of things may still allow that to be imaged. And so anyway, that's a little philosophy for you. These are the, the types of setups we have. And I brought a UV light to play around with and I brought, bought some, brought some goggles. And so at the end of the talk, we're gonna put these on and and look at this keyboard over here. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, so we'll see. <clears throat> so here's the different sources that you see. Uh, we've seen these in some of the other talks, like the sunlight of the tungsten lamp, um, the red scanning laser and HEB. You know, it's a some sort of diode laser now, but it used to be a helium neon laser, which was around 635 nanometers. Notice how narrow the laser is. That's also pretty narrow for LEDs. So LEDs emit in a very narrow band, and we'll see some of those. We have the mercury vapor lamp. Um, it's showing very little of the red, but there's also a red photon for the mercury vapor. So it's just barely showing that there. So we get R, G, and B, red, green, and blue from the mercury vapor, and that's why it appears white to us. Uh, that's why we still use it, even though it's toxic. So if you bust one of those lamps, especially if it's hot, you need to let everything cool down for a while because the mercury vapor is very little amount in there, but still um, it is toxic. So some people freak out when they break the curly bulb or whatever. It's, it's toxin is the dose, right? So uh, probably uh, be all right if you just, you know, let it cool down and give it an hour and then sweep it up. But definitely you want to wear, um, you'd want to disperse as little of that powder as possible. I'll just say that. <clears throat> So then we have all these different forensic light sources. And so you have a like a halogen lamp. It has almost no UV. The thing that makes it a halogen is you've got a, a filament in, inside the bulb. So you have this hot filament that you're running current through. And it gets really hot. And, and if you get it too hot, so here's your light, light bulb. If you get it too hot, the metal will sort of boil off and stick to the inside of the glass. And so you had to run these light bulbs at a lower wattage. So the old school light bulbs, 20, 40, 60, or 30, or 60, or 90, sometimes 100 watt bulbs, um, it, it really weren't that the availability to get more than a 100 watt bulb because it would get that filament would get so hot that it would start to degrade some of the metal would leave, would silver the inside of the bulb. And so in order to keep this boil off effect from happening, they would put a gas in there. A lot of these were in vacuum. So they would put a halogen gas, uh, like, like probably like chlorine, so Cl2 gas. And so that's why it's a halogen bulb. It's the halogen's not really making it, um, changing the light that comes out. It's just making it hotter. So the halogen, that gas keeps that, uh, that pressure keeps the metal from evaporating or subliming off. But that also means there's a, a lot more of heat transfer from the filament to the glass because it's not a vacuum in there. You have convective and collisional um, heat transfer. And so that's why those bulbs get so hot. Do you ever have the stand, the lamps in your living room with the halogen uh, bulb in it and the moth will fly in there and cook and stink like crazy? That's how hot these are. You know, the 100 watt bulbs wouldn't do that. If you had a 100 watt lamp, it'd be nice and bright, but a moth can hit it and not die instantly. But these are so hot that a moth is flying around to the light, hits that thing and gets shocked. And then it's 
falls into the little tray and just gets cooked and it stinks so bad. It makes me want to throw up. So Jennifer would complain that the moth would start burning and I'd be like, <clears throat> she's like, it's not that bad. <laughs> I was like, yes, it is. It's terrible. Um, so these quartz halogen lights, they produce a lot of near infrared. So they're great for near infrared vis uh, visibility. They don't produce very much UV and UV is useful for fluorescence. You can get specific metal halide lamps and we'll see some of those. They have limited UV, but very sharp peaks in the visible. Um, and then a xenon lamp is, is pretty good. Uh, it's got a pretty flat response in the visible region, means it's got a bright light in the blue all the way through to the red. But it gives off a lot more heat. So you've got to have a fan, a cooling fan that sucks battery power. So if this is going to be a battery powered light, you, you have to have a bigger unit that can hold a fan that can keep the light bulb cool. And then LEDs are fantastic. They're my favorite. They're wavelength specific. So you have to buy, like if you need a blue one, you have to buy a blue one. If you need a green one, you have to buy a separate light. It, you can't just use filters on them because they emit at very narrow wavelengths, but they last for a really long time. Sometimes, uh, you know, some of the lifetimes on some of these LED lights are 10,000 hours. Like of the, the lamp life for my projector is 10,000 hours. And so it's, it's that's pretty good long, long life. Here's the xenon arc lamp. And you can see this goes from the UV all the way out into the near infrared. And you can see that half of the energy that comes out of this light bulb is in the infrared. So that's not very useful for fluorescence. Uh, fluorescence, you're going to want things that are shorter wavelength than say the middle of the green spectrum. So right here, 532 is a really common laser, the neodymium ag laser, and it's bright green. So this is green right here. So green or blue illumination is what you want for fluorescence or UV. And UV is really great. Uh, if you have a uh, UV illumination, you don't even need um, any kind of filters. You can just see it with your eye. You see light because the UV doesn't reflect, doesn't, your eye doesn't detect the UV very much, but uh, you'll detect the visible photons. So you'll see all of the fluorescing light. Uh, what is all this text? Well, this is just talking about the different, um, like if you buy this lamp and it has an F suffix, it's got a silver reflector with a UV coating. If it has a UV suffix on the little product name, uh, it's an aluminum reflector and so on. So those are just some specifics to this particular xenon arc lamp. But you can see of, of all of the energy going into that lamp, only 35% of it is in the visible region. So that's, you know, you're only getting 35% out of your battery, et cetera. Uh, here's a, just for your note, you can look up all of these different lights and these uh, various manufacturers. So what this does, the, the light expands our detection limits. So it allows us to find and visualize more evidence. And we can then take photographs of the evidence, collect the evidence. And so it's a really a, a good crime scene tool. Um, in order to work efficiently, we need to know how to detect it. So, so we can use it in all of these different areas, like document examination, et cetera. Gun, gunshot residue, perhaps, if there's some fluorescent compounds in that. Uh, but biological fluids is probably the most common, finding biological fluids. And you can find these now. You don't have to go to those crime light sources. You can find a ton of these little UV lights. Uh, this is a nice one. This is about $30. Um, it's, you know, it's the, it chews through AA batteries pretty fast. So it's, it's probably not, um, I don't know, cost benefit. I mean, it's probably perfect. But those larger LED lights, the crime lights, they, they, they give off way more light. They have a, you know, they're rechargeable and so on. So you probably want to get one of those if it was for business use. But they sell these to detect pet, pet urine around the house. You got a weird smell. You're like, man, that cat did something in the carpet. I got to find it now, you know. Um, and so you can go around. And they even have cheaper ones. They have these little, um, they're like two bucks. They're so cheap, you can't buy one of them at Amazon. You got to buy like five or so, you know, a pack of five. Because they got to get the cost up to ten bucks somehow, so they're about two dollars a piece. They're not; they don't produce a lot of UV, so they don't produce. If it's not a lot of UV, then it's not a lot of fluorescence. But this one produces a pretty good amount of UV, 
it's um, I can turn it on. You can see you can't really see anything coming out. I'll try not to shoot too many eyes. Um, and that's because there's a black filter on there to keep the visible light down. And it's made out of coarse. It lets the UV through. So it's trying to just only let the UV light through. You turn the lights out. You can walk around with it and you can see where the cat has peed. Okay. So you're doing a little crime scene investigation on your cat. The cat mm -hmm. has a criminal. Okay. So uh, you can use absorption mode. This is really good. Blood absorbs around 415 nanometers. And so if you're shining with a blue light, blue crime light, blood will appear black. It will absorb. That's ox fresh blood, oxygenated blood. So you can find that very easily. You say, well, can't you see blood? Well, what if it's on a, a red carpet or some kind of, you know, mottled area, you know, asphalt? Is, is that blood or motor oil? You know, you can look with a blue light and maybe detect the difference. Um, specific illumination mode. So um, varying the angle of incidence. Now, this is a really useful technique. I wish I could show it. Uh, maybe you can... See if I can find there it is. Yeah. So angle of incidence. If if I'm using grazing angle to detect, I'm gonna just draw it here. If this is a surface with a particle on it, a tiny little particle or a fiber, if the light's coming down and your eye is over here and you're looking, notice how small the particle appears. If the light's coming this way at a grazing angle, look at how much shadow the particle casts. So grazing angle is great because you can see the shadows and it, it can it can make the particle look 10 times, 100 times larger than it is. So you can really detect particles and fibers easily with the grazing angle um, illumination. And that works really well. And then fluorescence mode. So using filters, these are filters for your eyes. You can put filters on cameras. You can uh, detect things with filters. You, you shine with a, like a blue laser and then look in the red region. Here's some more near IR illumination. So this uh, writing was obliterated with paint. And some of these cameras, like I said, they have sensors in them that go down to 900, 915 nanometers. And so if you put a a near infrared filter on the front and illuminate it with a bright tungsten lamp, something that puts out a lot of infrared light. Then the camera element has a lot of light for it to detect, but it can't see in the visible because you put a filter on it. But the filter needs to be able to pass the near infrared. And, and the element has, the sensing element has to be able to see in the near infrared. If you have the, like this uh, fine pics from Fujifilm, um, and I'm sure other cameras do it too, you can see right through that paint. And so that's pretty cool. Here's a burnt um, a burnt parchment. Like if you had something somebody tried to burn to conceal the message, you find a little fragment, you can see right through all of the soot in the near infrared. So that is pretty cool. So that'd be, again, uh, using really alternate light source, the near infrared detection. Um, let's look at fluorescence next. We can use opposite color illumination to eliminate a particular color. So if, if you want to detect something red, you use a blue light and then all of the red substances will appear black. So let's talk about fluorescence. So <clears throat> you want the substance to be excited by the short wavelength. So you see this is absorption. This is exciting the substance that you're trying to detect. And then the fluorescent emission is what you detect. So you need to figure out how to catch the fluorescence and not have your camera be blinded by the source. Because you're hitting the surface with a lot of light. And let's just think in terms of your eye or the camera. The camera is going to see that light unless you block it. So what we need is we need a barrier right here. Where's my thing? OK, we need a barrier right here that blocks that excitation light. So we need to detect everything in this region. So this detect region should go right here, like from this region all the way out. If we detect all of that light, then when there's no fluorescent particle or, or fiber or uh, stain, we won't see anything. 
And so that's sort of a black background. And then anything that fluoresces will glow in that image. So this rest of this talk is really how do we set up this barrier and this detection filter? Okay. So we have this excitation, excitation filter and a barrier filter. So this barrier filter looks like this. Um, it lets this light through and it cuts off and then it doesn't let that light through. So that's the shape of the barrier filter for detection. Okay. So we need that, that we've got two T's or two L's, I don't know. So that's our detector filter. And then if we had like a xenon lamp, the, and we had this huge broad spectrum of light, we would need to put a, a filter on the excite, excitation. So we would want to block all of the light that's in the visible region below this detection wavelength. So this would be the exciter filter. And you can say, or LED, which just has a nice bright peak, you know, right here. So if we just have an LED light that gives off that peak, we don't need any filters on our source because it's putting out blue light only. And then we, um, <clears throat> we could turn the lights out and not even need a barrier filter on our camera. But it's best if we put one on. No, no, we wouldn't need a barrier filter on our camera just to keep the blue LED light from showing up in the image. <clears throat> okay, so this is a fluorescence optical system. We have our light. Let's say it's a broad wavelength light like a xenon lamp or tungsten halogen lamp. And we put this barrier filter here, um, exciter. And this is the detec detection filter. And so the blue light comes through, hits the sample. Some of the blue light is scattered, but that light is blocked by the detection filter. And the yellow or the orange light, the only way you're gonna get orange light is from fluorescence because the orange light off of this light bulb was blocked over here. So there's no orange light coming through, but we have orange light coming out of the sample. It's because we found something that's fluorescent. Now there's a lot of fluorescent compounds in the body. A lot of the amino acids fluoresce, and so you have um, <clears throat> you would have um, proteins, you're detecting proteins, some of those amino acids fluoresce, and uh, some of the base pairs and DNA fluoresce, and so you can detect DNA this way, uh, and that's going to be in all your cells. So cellular material fluoresces, and then a lot of the, the um, what do I want to say, those uh, steroidal type compounds, anything that's really not a, not a fat or a protein or a carbohydrate, um, is going to be like a steroid type molecule and that's going to be in those cell membranes and so all of your cell membranes are these long big flat molecules those fluoresce like crazy too so basically we're made of a ton of fluorescent material so if i'm trying to find something biological on the surface fluorescence is a great way to go so skin cells will just glow like crazy um, if it's somebody has sweated a lot and there's a lot of protein in their sweat then you can see like sweaty marks and stuff food residue so we use that emission filter to select the illumination wavelengths. We use the detection filter to block those illumination wavelengths. And then we have uh, those fluorescent wavelengths are detected by our eye and the camera. So the guy's wearing his, his goggles, so he's looking for the fluorescent material. It doesn't look like there's a filter on the camera that took this picture because we see the illumination light. We see a lot of blue light. And so they took this with the camera with, um, with no filter so that we could see this bright crime light source. This is an old school source. It's a, you see, it's a big old, huge, heavy box. It'd be hard to tote that thing around, but it's nice and bright. So it's a trade off. The brighter the light, the bigger the box. And then I went and found some, some example images this year of saliva, semen, and urine. So you can see those are sort of example stains of each. And, and just it's just related to the amount of cellular and protein material that's in there. There's not a lot in saliva, so it's a little dimmer um, image. But yeah, you can detect that pet urine. You look around. Um, 
it's it's kind of disgusting but don't ever take this to a hotel room <laughs> yeah don't want to know just <laughs> don't want to okay so uh filters come in two flavors interference and absorption filters so we're going to talk about those uh, interference filters are more complicated more expensive and they're typically tied to a particular wavelength and they would be used used for uh, if you had a laser. So if you were coming in with a 532 nanometer laser with a really narrow wavelength, then you would want to use an interference filter on your camera that would block that wavelength really efficiently. So they're expensive, but if you're buying a laser system, you probably throw that into the cost. The laser system is expensive. And so you probably get interference filters for your cameras and some special goggles that block that laser light. So you could walk around shining this incredibly bright laser and just not even see it. And that's what you'd want. Because if you, if you, uh, if you don't have those special goggles on, the, the laser is so bright that it's like you're um, sort of like you're blinded, like you get a flash or like a car light hits you in the eyes. Your eyes are fatigued by such a bright light. And so you just really can't see anything. You look away, you see spots. So you're really not, it's really not useful for detection with the bare eye. You need those goggles to block the laser light. And that's using an interference filter. Uh, they can tolerate much more heat than the absorption filter because they're not really absorbing the light. They're, they're causing it to go at different angles. Um, so it's canceling out the light. So this is how an interference filter works. It's got a, a very a fine-tuned layer. The layer thickness has to be some integer multiple of the wavelength plus one half of that wavelength. So uh, why one half? Well, look what's going on. The blue light comes in and it goes down here, up here, down here. And it's, see, it's, it's one, and this, what I've shown is one full wavelength of light here. Um, let's see, one full wavelength of light right here is the, the you know, from down up down, and then it goes down it hits and comes back and then when it hits here it goes back up and then when it hits here it's completely out of phase so it cancels with the light so it's this internal reflection it goes forward reflects back and goes forward again out of phase and cancels that light and so then very little light comes out at this angle you say well Energy is neither created nor destroyed. Where does it come out? Well, it will create interference fringes. And so coming off at different angles would be the light. So it's a resonant cavity. So that's how we keep it from heating up. It's really directing the light at different angles, like a diffraction grating or a, um, or a gra yeah, diffraction grating or, or a, a volume diffraction grating. So coming out straight on axis with that light you see very little of that light. You turn, tilt the filter a little bit, and you're going to see the light coming out at different angles. So how do we keep that light from interfering? Well, we just put this inside a filter housing where that light is absorbed. So we put this in a big block. And so the light coming out at different angles is absorbed. And so very little light makes it through the filter. And the light that comes out at different angles is absorbed by this heavy housing, and it can handle the heat. Absorption filters, all of the light that's attenuated is absorbed by the glass of the filter. And so if you have a really bright source, if you have an inter, uh, absorption filter, that absorption filter is going to heat up and degrade over time. There's going to be dye molecules in there, and those dye molecules are going to be bleached out by that light eventually. So there's a, life, a shorter lifetime for these. I mean, in the interference filter, those thin layers, sometimes they can wear out too. So I mean, they're not perfect, but... Absorbance filters definitely absorb more light and, and heat up more. Here's some spectra of the different uh, filters, and I want to teach you this language or vocabulary related to filters. So we have this short pass absorption filter. Now, what on earth, what is this about? What's going on with short? What is a short pass filter? It's a wavelength. Whenever you hear short and long, think wavelength. Okay. Short and long refer to wavelengths.
And so we have this edge wavelength right here. So the filter, like this one looks like it might be like a 490 or 480 EW. So you would say like four, let's see, we'll say 480 EW um, short. So that might be in the catalog when you're looking for filters. And if you want to let blue light through, that's the filter you're looking for. So it's telling you that at 480 nanometers, that's half, half the light gets through at 4, 480. Less than 480, all the light gets through. Above 480, none of the light gets through. So it's an edge wavelength. Anything above 480 is blocked. Everything below 480 is passed. That's what the pass means. So it's a short pass. Let's pass the shorter wavelengths. And so that would be your blue filter. And if you look at it, you hold it up to the light, you see blue light coming through. And so you know, okay, this is my blue filter. I'm gonna put that on my source, the, the emission, the, the excitation um, source. This is also called a high pass filter. So what does the high relate to? Mm -hmm. Energy, good job. Right, so short wavelengths are high energy. So this is a high pass filter too. So you might see 480W high. And so then you would say, okay, it's gonna pass the, the high uh, energy light. So, you know, just like the energy level diagrams we did in PCHEM, right? The higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength. Okay. And then here's a long pass filter. So this one's like a, I don't know, 540, 550. So you might see this in the catalog of 545 EW low or long. And so what it's saying is that <clears throat> wavelengths longer than 545 are passed and, and wavelengths shorter than that are blocked. So this is perfect. We could combine those two filters. We have the um, the first one. What was it? Five hundred and something? No, four eighty. Perfect. Whoa, tripping me out. Okay. So it comes along here, four eighty, and it drops off. And so this would be the exciter, and this would be the detector. <clears throat> Make sense? Okay, let's, like if I wanted to do, determine what these glasses were, and I don't have a, like, I don't know the, like I bought these, these are cheapo safety glasses, but they're obviously yellow, so they're doing some sort of edge pass. Um, um, you know, is it low or is it long or short? Let's ask that. So this is, this is passing a certain band of, of light. Would it be, a short pass or a long pass? Why would you say long? I think you're right, but why are you white? Right, right, right. Yeah, yellow's yellow and red, which this will pass red as well, is a longer wavelength. This one has got a, a longer wavelength, but it's passing just the red. So, so if I had uh, a yellow crime light, this wouldn't be very good. But if I had a yellow crime light, this would catch anything that fluoresced with yellow light. Not likely, but it could pass, uh, you know, so I could put a yellow crime light out and I could wear these and only things that fluoresce in the red area would be detected. So if I wanted to figure out what the wavelength was for the passing, I'd just stick these in the, in the visible spectrometer. So you could go find a visible spectrometer take a reference scan, stick this in there, take a sample scan, plot it, and it would look like this, something similar to that. So it's pretty easy. If you've forgotten the labels of your filters or whatever, just stick them in the spectrometer, get a quick scan. Um, you can use the USB uh, um, spectrometer. Okay, and then they have bandpass filters, which uh, is, again, a band of wavelengths. And so it cuts off the short and the long wavelengths and passes a central wavelength. So notice how this one's not giving you the edge wavelengths, it's giving you the central wavelength. So in this case, it's like a 460 
um, CW or it might say BP band pass and it might give you the plus or minus like the HBW the the, um, the this width I would say what, 60 so 460 CW 60 this is this is probably the range of the uh, or width I'll say width A very narrow one, like if you had a, an interference filter or a notch filter, it would be very narrow and it'd be focused on whatever source you had. So they would be coupled with the source. So if you buy a, a, a 532 nanometer laser, you're going to get goggles and filters. Um, you can add those on uh, to, to block 532. Again, if this gets all mixed up, sometimes they all look the same. They're just really dark filters. Um, no, no, no. Um, for a, like a laser filter, uh, for like a 532, it would just look off. It would be glass, but it would be, there's something, it's absorbing something, but it still passes most of the light. So it looks almost clear. And you can stick that in the spectrometer and see, and when you get to 532, you would see the absorbance go up to infinity and drop back down. So you'd see this really narrow notch where it absorbs. So here's the hand scope, xenon. You see, it's kind of big and bulky. It's not that bad, but some of them, again, they have a battery pack on the hip. <laughs> so, so you carry around your the lithium ion battery pack. You got a cable here. Well, so what's in the back here? If it's not a battery pack, that's the fan. Fan and the and the and the source, the light. So you got the light in this tube, and then what's in this thing right here? This little housing. It's got a little thumb wheel on it, and those are filters. So that's a pretty handy thing because you've got the filters on there. You can switch it to UV, you can switch it to blue, orange, yellow, all these different source um, filters that you can use. <clears throat> so here's all of the different things it has in the hand scope. Seven positions for the filter wheels. It comes with different goggles. Um, the clear ones, it's important. Like I'm not, I don't want to shine this in your eye because it is UV, and uh, I've heard that it'll, you know, long exposure can give you cataracts to UV light. And that's why you should wear sunglasses outside and go to the beach and all. Um, and so I don't want to, I don't want to hurt our eyes. But plastic, just any kind of plastic, is good enough to absorb UV. So you can have clear plastic glasses, cheapo glasses, and they'll protect your eyes from UV. So that's nice to know. And then uh, here's the forensic crime lights. So notice they have different wavelengths. They're great for, um, for finding body fluids or uh, for detecting like fingerprints, like with the treated super glue fingerprints. And so here's the different spectral profiles. Look how narrow they are. So they almost look like lasers. Lasers are a little narrower than this. Uh, this because the laser is in a resonant cavity and uh, the uh, stimulated emission is all in phase. So it's all just almost exactly the same wavelength. Whereas an LED, um, there is, uh, I mean, they're just fine tuned for a particular energy. And so, but there's some broadening in, in the little LEDs. It's not a laser. And so these are the different wavelengths. Most of them are in the green to purple because they're used for fluorescent detection. And so you want the blue side of things, and then you can look with yellow or orange goggles. And, and detect the fluorescence. So the advantages of LEDs, they last longer, they don't have to warm up, so they have a consistent uh, full color, 100% light from the very begin beginning. Uh, they last a long time, so you can get a DC operation, you can have lithium ion batteries that are rechargeable. Um, they also are very um, robust, like if you drop that xenon light, uh, you can bust the filament or the little you know, mechanics of that bulb. Um, and so that's, they're much more fragile. There's no toxic gases, no fragile filament, no ozone or UV is produced uh, or needed. Uh, and then uh, there's very little infrared light. So whatever the energy goes in is coming out at that green wavelength. 
So I'm a big fan of LEDs, obviously. And then we have these really expensive ones, uh, but again, a much, much brighter source. So the brighter the light, the, the better the detection, so you can get better contrast. <clears throat> and so this is what the, like a neodymium, neodymium YAG laser from spectrophysics, fiber optic. So you would come to the crime scene. This is, you see the little latches and everything. It comes in a little hardened case. You set it down, you pop the top off, and then it has this reel and you can unreel it. And this is the little handheld light source. So you plug this in someplace and then you can walk around with a fiber optic light source, dragging your little cable with you. You've got your glasses on so you don't see the light at all. And then when you find the evidence, you have a camera with the, the interference filter on it and then you can take uh, your evidence photos and really good detection limits with these laser sources. But this is a really bright laser, you know, five to eight watts continuous power is enough to really damage your eye. So if this were focused on your eye, then you can, but a lot of times these are defocused to a spot about that big so that you can do a survey of the area and it makes it eye safe. If you take five watts and distribute it over, you know, a square foot of area, um, it's really bright to the eye, but it's not the reflections of all of those little pieces are not enough to damage your retina. If that was focused and you got hit in the eye with a focused beam of five watts, you would have a blind spot. And there is one little defect on my retina whenever I get a retina scan. It's been there, you know, every time I've had those. And I think it's a laser hit from when I did graduate research. So, yeah, um, it could have been a reflection. Uh, we always worked with the laser at low power. Um, because if if you working at a high power, even the reflection off of your thumbnail could blind you. And so there was a story on our bulletin board of a graduate student at another university who was aligning the laser at full power and his hand passed the beam and he was looking at what he was doing and the laser hit his thumbnail and hit him in the eye, one of the eyes, and that guy damaged his retina right right in the middle. And so one of his eyes is permanently damaged from that. So lasers are nothing to mess with. I mean, you know, it's true. You don't stare into the beam. <laughs> it's, a, it's a far side of a bunch of guys standing around with patches over one eye. And there's a guy in there like, come on, do it. <laughs> the peer pressure. Yeah. And then, so don't do that. So that's really all I have for the lecture. But let's play around with the light. And so um, I wanted to show this keyboard because before class, I kind of looked at it and can I get you to turn the lights out? And I need I need a helper. So can I get a volunteer? Okay. So I, or, either one. Yeah. Both of you can. So put these on so you can see. And I'm going to go around to the other side of the computer. And I want you to hold this keyboard up to where the camera can see the, the enter key. It's kind of hard. To do. There we go. Yeah, right there. You see the inner key right there on the camera? I'm going to come around here. And somebody typed on this keyboard with, I don't know, milk on their hands or something. See, look at that. Can you see that? Can the can they, uh, computer see that? Uh, it sees like a really bright Really bright spot, spot yeah. So see the backspace key? Can you see that? Oh. No, I can't. See, look at that. That's nasty. <laughs> but you can really, there's some fibers on there, maybe some skin cells. Can you, know. like, uh, move the light back? It, huh? The insert is bad, too. Because, like, the light shining off of it, like, it's okay. really bright. Okay, let me try a different angle. How's that? Okay, I see a really big spot on it. Yeah, okay, okay, I can see where. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just kind of show the class. Oh, we'll show you in the face. Okay, so let's look at this. Can y'all see that just from your desks? Um, see that? Look at that. Can you see it from there? Yeah. It might not, you can't see anything without, without the UV light. So you shine a UV light on there and you see all kinds of just debris and everything on the keyboard. So that's what an alternate light source would get you. There's a really bright spot right there on the B. I mean, this is, spot was so big, I thought it was just the light. <laughs> now this without the glasses. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. It's um, 
something splashed. I think there's a splash mark across the space bar and going over to the question mark, the enter, the backspace, and the insert key. So it's like something, like maybe coffee with creamer in it or something. I don't know. But it's something that has a fluorescent compound in it, but it could be protein or or something. I don't know. And then in the page up. So they got on their hands and then they hit page up. Yeah. So that's crazy. This monitor, oh yeah, it's a splash on the monitor too. Y'all come around and look. Yeah, that's right. We'll touch this one. I don't see much on there. Look at that right there. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, look at that bright fiber. Right by the L. You probably can't see it on that side. Come look. I can oh, yeah. see it. Oh. I can see it over here. Yeah. I can yeah. See it. See that's the that splash right there. Oh yeah. yeah. It went it went across here, and all the way up onto the monitor. <laughs> yeah. So I know that the keyboard was this is kind of cool because I know that the keyboard was likely right here, you know, because it's this line right there. So right there, that's where the keyboard is. If, it all, if that's what happened, you know, I don't know. But. And I promise I didn't come in here and spill stuff. <laughs> the grazing angle, you can kind of see. You don't get a lot of reflection off the surface, but look at all the all the little fibers and things. Isn't that cool? That is so exciting. And I came right down here one time with the pink fluorescent uh, fingerprint powder, and it got everywhere. So there's a big fiber right there. It's probably a cotton fiber. Cotton will fluoresce. And look how bright that little spot is right there, whatever that is. So you get these little things under the microscope and see, you know, some of these are skin cells, some of these are little fibers. And see, there's a fiber that doesn't fluoresce. So who knows what that is? But I can see it because of the shadow. Come look at the shadow. Come look at that. I'm going to get it right there. And you can see the shadow of the fiber on the table. Wouldn't it fluoresce if there was a hole? I don't know. Because <laughs> it has protein. Yeah, I know. Let me pull one out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing it so bad, I'm surely it would come out. No, I don't see a lot of fluorescence out of my hair. <laughs> I can't get any out. I don't know where it's going. There's one. Oh, it stuck to my finger. But right there, the, the little cuticle has some fluorescence on it. <clears throat> See that end of the hair? Yeah. Like the and I hear that they get DNA out of the cuticle. Yeah, mm -hmm. from standards. Yeah, so that's the DNA that's fluorescent. So, you know, that's my hair or not. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? And this is a little $30 light. Like I said, I would not take this to the hotel. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about it. I'm so bad. Yeah, there's, this is kind of dirty. I need to clean it. What about my mouse? I don't even want to look. Not too bad. It's a new mouse. Pen. Oh, yeah. Look at that thing. Yeah. That's bad. But, I mean, you can find, oh, look at that bright fiber underneath. So, okay, well, that's alternate light source. I get, I get really excited about this, as you can imagine. Because it's neat. I like to find things. And of course, for cleaning, that's part of my research, too. If you're trying to see if a part is clean or not. Uh, man, this... $30 thing in a, in a factory that produces million dollar parts, you know, that's nothing. You could put one of these on everybody's pocket and they could see if everything was clean.